Can you start by introducing yourself? Sure, I'm Philip Ahrens. And um, what do you do? Uh, by day, <laughs> uh, I'm a real estate developer. Mm -hmm. uh, and in uh, uh, many hours, I choose to uh, not follow my um, regular profession. I'm a uh, supporter of artists interested in producing art um, and most particularly artists introduce, interested in producing artist books. Mm -hmm. And zines. And zines, of course. <laughs> and uh, how did you came to be interested in art? I was uh, hard to say the specific reasons. I had a, uh, a father who was both a scientist and a photographer and he always brought me around to various um, art exhibitions, gallery shows, museums, and uh, brought me with him when he both took photographs and developed photographs. So I had an appreciation of what it was like um, for an artist to work. Um, and then when I went to college, I was an art history major. Um, and so I got to study art history and fell in love with it. And I fell in love at that time with the books um, that are related to art in the broadest possible sense. And is that when you started collecting, by collecting books? I were? started collecting by buying books, yes. Um, in uh, Realistically, when I started, I didn't have the resources to buy art and wasn't really focused on buying art, um, but books were accessible. Um, and so I would make sure that every exhibition I went to, and I went to many, um, I would buy the catalog and I would look for materials about art and artists um, that I could afford. Um, and then I had a major um, sort of epiphany, for lack of a better word, uh, when I realized that there was a whole movement of art, um, conceptualism, um, in particular, where artists began to use the book as an alternative means of artistic production slash, slash expression. And that was a wonderful moment for me because I saw that my interest in art and my interest in books could coalesce around mm -hmm. a single um, thing, object, um, i.e. artist books and zines. Mm -hmm. And I, from that moment on, I was unstoppable <laughs> in my enthusiasm. Do you remember which book led you to this uh, epiphany? Or yes, I remember. it was actually a scholarly book um, about um, the history of contemporary art exhibitions by a man named Bruce Altshuler. And his, he mentioned Seath Siegelaub's famous production um, of a uh, gallery show that was represented primarily in its catalog. Mm -hmm. And I said, how great is that? You don't even have to go to the gallery. You can just get the book. And the book is, from Siegelob's perspective, um, the entire exhibition. And again, um, that was a revelation. And, and so do you also remember the, the first artist book that you owned when you knew that it was both an artwork and a book like you were used I to? remember a particular infatuation with um, the Xerox book, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, with um, some of the early uh, conceptual um, books by Carl Andre or Bastian Otter or people like that. Um, I was fascinated with books that were entirely simple and plain. And early on, of course, I, I understood the unbelievable revolution that Ed Ruscha's books um, established and and later on you you started supporting artists and supporting their work by producing uh, also books uh, about uh, what you do yeah I was very interested like. in making sure that artists who were struggling to start their careers had an opportunity of producing something that would help their career mm -hmm. and books and catalogs frequently did that my wife and I frequently would support the production of a catalog for an exhibition. We've done that consistently now for 30 years or so. Um, and occasionally would step in and help artists who came and said, I'd like to do a book, a simple artist book. 
but I'm short a thousand dollars or whatever and we would say okay you know what's the plan what's the idea um, and get behind something like and, and you were also at the origin of uh, reference books like uh, uh, queer zines or, or in numbers? Yeah, I thought that it would be nice, as I kept collecting, <laughs> that this material be more widely available to people. Um, and in particularly the material that's the most ephemeral, so I started with that. And what's most ephemeral are artist periodicals and artist zines. Um, those are things that artists make. Um, to uh, give away or trade um, and as a consequence there's no market and without a market there's not that many people who really work mm -hmm. hard to preserve them unfortunately um, so I thought it would be interesting to try to um, use whatever resources I could muster um, to do books that documented artist periodicals um, which I did a book called In Numbers I did a book on Mark Gonzalez's zines, I did two volumes of queer zines, and I kept uh, thinking about ways of trying to help people um, organize thoughts about uh, mm -hmm. art zines or art books. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're doing with uh, art zines? I don't know what I'm doing with art <laughs> zines. I think that may be more of a question for later. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a question was, what did you have in mind when you suggested that? Uh... I had in mind, um, I think the beginning of what would be another sort of uh, serious attempt to pull together information about artist scenes. Um, I think the challenge though is, as we've worked together, um, is that the area is just so gigantic um, that while I'm a fan of the what I consider to be the guerrilla incursions that you do with <laughs> independent publications, um, I'm struggling with the idea, something to talk about later or, or now on camera, whatever. <laughs> the difficulty of how to pull all of that information into something mm -hmm. that might um, generate further conversations and further work on the whole subject mm -hmm. of artist scenes. Because the the problem that I'm facing in my own way is uh, it, what do you select and, and how do you um, tell if a zine is an interesting part of this history and, and which one should be featured in, in a project uh, because as you, like this because um, as you said there are thousands and thousands of zines that are produced daily and um, so how do you know uh, what is a good zine, or how can you tell uh, which one you think would be important to to show more? Well, in the United States, you know, for um, in the middle of the last century, there was a famous case um, at the United States Supreme Court um, uh, concerning pornography, and the Chief Justice who wrote the decision said simply. Well, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> and my feeling is that good zines are a little bit like that. They're mm -hmm. sort of hard to define. Um, but you kind of know it when you see it and feel mm -hmm. it and respond to it in a visceral way. Um, I must confess to something that may not be entirely justifiable. Um, and I did the same sort of selection thinking on the book just published artists who make books. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very interested in people for whom zine publications are a long-term and continuing mm -hmm. interest. Mm -hmm. Whether they are necessarily producing the best zines, mm -hmm. I can't answer that question. Um, but I'm interested in those people who aren't just doing one zine or five zines, mm -hmm. but someone who's, who's doing you know, 50 to mm -hmm. 250 zines for whom the publications of zines is an ongoing sort of mission. Now, there are some people doing that who don't do good zines. I'm not going to mention their <laughs> names, but there are. Um, having said that, there are a lot of people who fit in that category whose passion for zines really does make them, in my opinion, worthy of further discussion. And that's all, uh, you know, I'm not interested in a hierarchical um, 
statement of mm -hmm. what's great art and mm -hmm. what's not and what's great mm -hmm. scenes and what's not. I'm interested in, in advancing the dialogue around zines mm. and zine making and people who make zines. So would you say that there are no masterpieces in zines and that it's more about commitment and, and about the act of publishing? I, I'm not sure whether there are zine masterpieces. As I said in an exhibition I did in Los Angeles, I believe there are zine masters mm -hmm. and I believe there are people for whom the zine format has unlocked a uniquely brilliant sort of um, uh, creative opportunity. And I think those zine masters um, are people uh, of extraordinary talent and, and worthy of further study. Um, can you tell about uh, some artists that are... Uh, well, when I started yeah, with, uh, when I did Zine of Masters of the Universe, mm -hmm. <laughs> I included uh, Ray Pettibon, mm -hmm. Mark Gonzalez, mm -hmm. uh, Ari Markopoulos, um, and Dash Snow. Mm -hmm. um, would I add people? Absolutely. Um, I would add uh, Bruno Richard. <laughs> I would add uh, Pat McCarthy. Mm -hmm. um, I would add uh, Cameron Jamie. Um, I would add um, uh, a bunch of people who are kind of publishing in the sort of punk aesthetic. Um, uh, on Weird Dave, who publishes Fuck This Life. There are many, and many, many more, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tom Sachs, um, who I think are just extraordinary in both the quality of the zines they produce and their commitment to producing scenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell us about how you built your collection? Is there an, a direction it's going to, or, or how did it start? Well, I think it follows a little bit what we just said, of trying to deal with people that I think are, keeping up with people I think are extraordinary producers. Mm -hmm. I'm also very interested in zine publishers, such as yourself, um, zine makers um, who have a ability to look around and see what's going on mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of the you know people who have been um, fostering zine making among other people even mm -hmm. um, like a Neves or like an, uh, other publishers um, so I look for that wherever I go but then of course I'm a sucker for a zine made by someone I've never met or someone I never knew or someone mm -hmm. I've, or something I've never seen before. And it's particularly exciting when that develops into a longer mm. uh, relationship. Then do you have a lot of zines that are completely anonymous? Yes. Like you have no idea where they came from? Or... Yes. Mm. Sadly, I do. Um, and I don't know... I don't know what to do with those. <laughs> <laughs> I have them going way back. Um, because I was interested in buying zines that were uh, offered to me that were historically interesting. Mm. Skate zines, for example, which were fascinating. Queer zines, as you know, um, which were more community building concepts, zines mm -hmm. used as a way of a network of exchange and dialogue. Um, I was fascinated by that. Um, but yes, if the simple question is, do I have thousands of zines that I have no, no idea what they are? Um, yes, is the answer for that. Yeah. Gary Panter is a great zine maker over mm -hmm. the time. And how do you see the connection between uh, zines and artist book? Do you think there there is a point of connection? Or? Yeah, I sort of kind of think that they're just one's a, a, a variant, a less formal. More, um, independent kind of reflection of the other. Um, I think when an artist makes an artist book um, and thinks of it as an artist book, that puts it in a category that's been known and accepted in mm. both the market and art historically. But when an artist makes a zine, He's making something that he wants to relate to a very different audience, mm -hmm. not an audience of collectors, not an audience of galleries or curators, but an audience of his peers, an audience of his colleagues. 
and yeah, how do you see? But that is changing because now that zines are becoming more and more trendy, people are doing zines in with a more specific idea of what zines are supposed to be. They're reproducing something that that they're seeing. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> no, you don't. Think I mean, so? I I think maybe. Uh, it'd be interesting. We should have a more specific conversation with specific zines in mind. Mm. Um, do I think people are making zines to be part of a zine culture? I think they always did that a little bit. Mm, yes. um, do I think it's more? I don't know. I mean, if you're making something that can never sell for more than $15 or whatever, mm. I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, that's a definitely a choice. <laughs> so. Sure. And um, yeah, I'd like. I'd like. You often say that um, that you like zines because they are a direct connection to the artist. Um, can you talk about uh, that sure. relationship? I mean, that that my, with... my my specific interest in zines is I believe they are the clearest manifestation of an artist's intent mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't have to pass through anybody else's hands it doesn't need an editor it doesn't need a designer it doesn't need a printer it doesn't need a publisher it doesn't need a sales rep mm -hmm. it doesn't need a store it doesn't need anything but the artist's hand now as we touched on in this panel that was yesterday at MoMA PS1 I mean there are some zine makers who are really as you maybe have alluded to, who are making zines in a slightly more um, scripted way, for lack mm -hmm. of making it on their computer and then having it mm. printed and not really the old-fashioned cutting, pasting, mm. and bringing it to the copy shop and standing there while you staple your copies. I'm more interested in those, mm. the zines of the Kinko's copying. Um, and that's not always the case because I believe that for lack of a better expression, it is a form of art that most clearly represents the unmediated hand of the artist. Mm -hmm. Because it was directly made? Yeah, because I think it's a, a you know, I, and, you know, I mean, there was a wonderful moment at the conference, at the panel yesterday when Benjamin Buko, one of the great scholars of this period, said, did um, Laura Serena really think that by putting the price, $1.95, on his book statements, he was revolutionizing the world, that all artworks from then on would be $1.95, mm -hmm. or was that some sort of ironic statement? Um, and I thought that was a brilliant point. I don't think we know the answer to that, although Lawrence is still alive, you could probably ask him. But that's a little bit about, you know, the sort of same issue with Z-Makers. Are they making this in an attempt to subvert mm -hmm. um, the system, were they making it, I don't think they're making it as part of the system, but I think people, even when they're making a canvas to give to a gallery, they're responding to market pressures, mm -hmm. of what their gallery is telling them they can sell, um, what the gallery, what the auction houses have responded to, and many artists resist that, mm -hmm. but even that resistance is a form of engagement mm -hmm. and not a form of pure Here's what I want to say, and I'm going to draw it, state it, print it, copy it, publish it. Yeah, and this famous quote, quote John Baldessa, he says that um, with the artist books, uh, when he gives them to his friend, uh, art seems pure for a yes. moment. Um, now, those artist books from this period are very expensive and they are not $1.99 uh, like they used to. Do you think there's a, a political dimension uh, to zines that keeps them uh, not pure but... Um, Less expensive. <laughs> and For now. I mean, who knows what will happen and who knows what will change and maybe I'm doing zine culture a disservice by trying to document <laughs> zines. Um, I'm not going to worry about that, I don't think, but um, I think the whole quality of what zines are how they're handled and how they're distributed will always continue to appropriately keep them outside the traditional art market. Mm -hmm. Yes, because a lot of the artists 
not not all of them, but some artists that you uh, collect zines of uh, also have gallery representation Absolutely. and exist uh, in in the art market, and and some of them don't at all. Um, yes. Do you see a, a difference between the way the they make art? I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, I don't. I don't see a difference in the way they make zines, mm -hmm. and that's what's exciting for me. Mm -hmm. Someone like Cameron Jamie has a, one of the best galleries in the world representing him, but he's still making obscure, fabulous, you know, mm -hmm. modest publications um, that he has printed by friends who publish you know, Chinese restaurant menus in Berlin mm -hmm. and sells them for $20. So, mm -hmm. um, Tom Sachs is the same. Mm -hmm. The zines are a part of what he's doing, mm -hmm. but he's selling works at a major gallery. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think they change the way they produce or think about their zines, mm -hmm. to be honest. But, and one of the things I like about zines is that you can be selling works in a gallery and still be giving away zines. Mm -hmm. But aren't they changing the way people perceive zines? I don't think so. I think the people who are collecting these artists have zero interest in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but zero. in the zine culture, like a lot of people would uh, find that uh, $20 is still too much for, for a zine and that when it doesn't have that uh, political aspect or, or, of distribution, then it shouldn't even be uh, called a zine. Tom's uh, zines uh, are printed all in color. Some of them are one hundred dollars. Do you think you can still call it a zine if it's uh, one hundred dollars? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, I do. <laughs> I mean, I think it's an expensive zine, but I think it's a zine in terms of its intent. And I think Tom mm -hmm. would think of it. It's available at Printed Matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know you can get a Tom Sachs zine that's amazing for a hundred dollars, whereas you could get a Tom Sachs work for one hundred and twenty-five thousand. So, I mean, the relevance, the related um, relationship between mm -hmm. those two still stays the same. Do I think, you know, do I think in a totally pure Baldessare esque mm. world <laughs> that it would be great for everything to be $1.95 or for Ed Bruchet to continue to sell? He also his says at the beginning of the quote that every artist should have a cheap line. So yeah, exactly. that, that works for what you were say, exactly. uh, saying. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's important for you in all of this? I think what's important is to um, try to wrap my mind around uh, why zines are interesting, both to me and to others, because I'm not the only one. Um, and there was a rash, a rush or a rash of studies, but they were a long time ago. and. There's a couple of new books out that sort of try to discuss underground publishing. Mm -hmm. um, one about underground publishing in Germany that just came out on mm -hmm. the radar. Um, and what's important to me is, having finished my book on artist books, is to probably work for the next five or so years on thinking about um, why zines are interesting and if and are they important. I know they're interesting. I have no idea if they're important. Perfect. Thank you.